So, welcome back to Third Age Reforged and to another battle replay, and of course, we are on Minas Tirith, and I believe it will be three days actually before this, well, between videos and when this one comes out, which is why I'm doing Minas Tirith now. Uh, I am aware of the fact that a lot of people have sent me stuff, and I promise I will get round to them, but obviously I can only work so quickly. Uh, so if you have sent me something within the past three or even four weeks, and I haven't gotten around to it yet, don't worry, I am keeping track of which battles have and haven't been shown. Uh, Minas Tirith was sent to me sometime last week, but I decided I would show it now because a three-day gap is longer than usual uh, from when I post stuff, and obviously scheduling issues with university are abound now. Uh, it shouldn't happen too often though, uh, so here we are with Minas Tirith of course. And it will be a good versus evil siege as well, so there's going to be four attackers and three armies as the defenders. Uh, so obviously people will be happy from a lore perspective. We shall see if the defenders are able to once again overturn the numbers deficit, because in the last two siege battles I've shown, uh, the defenders were able to overcome a deficit. Both in those two occasions, however, it was against a two army deficit. This is only one, so comparatively speaking, the defenders this time have it relatively easy. Um, but obviously you'd still expect the attackers to make a numbers advantage pay. We'll get on to the intricacies of defending on Minas Tirith in just a moment though. We'll start off with the attacking armies to see what they have brought and what the defenders can expect. So we shall start off with Barnak, and I believe some of these players are slightly newer. A lot of the names are not as familiar to me, uh, but that's good. Uh, on both sides this is the case, so hopefully we'll be seeing a relatively even spread in terms of skill. As I was saying though, Barnak is playing as the Orcs of the Misty Mountains, which in point nine six are particularly potent in certain areas, particularly with regards to this unit, Heavy Goblin Spears, because they can obviously add that shield wall, which increases the mass so they can help push through, and obviously that armor piercing ability, and the fact they're pretty decent in terms of stats for spears, uh, the AP certainly makes up for their spear malice in certain areas as well, so a very key unit for the Misty Mountains. As I've said a few times before at this point, in point... 9-7, the Heavy Goblin Spears will be made slightly less effective overall because they'll be brought more into line with their Heavy Goblin Brethren, uh, but they will still fulfill basically the same role, and I don't think you'll see many Misty Mountains armies without them even in point nine seven when they're made a little bit less effective because they're such a key part to how the Misty Mountains go about their business, both in sieges and on the open field, two units of them. Uh, we also have some Goblin Archers, which obviously... The Misty Mountains in general, they do have some decent skirmishes, but their archer line is generally fairly low quality. Uh, but obviously in point nine six, low quality individual archers doesn't really matter because it's the volume uh, which is going to net you your value. And in particular, the Misty Mountains can achieve this with their basic goblin archers. Obviously, I've said before, even if you're on the attack, it can be a good idea to get some cheap archers on the go just so that you have some sort of answers, something that you can skirmish with to do damage to enemies at range. Because if it turns into a pure melee fight and you're stuck in a choke point with no way to affect the fight, uh, you could be in a bit of trouble. Uh, but we also have this unit back here, the Heavy Goblin Crossbowman, which is really where the Misty Mountains take their ranged punch from. Uh, crossbows, as I've said before, have got a significant amount of stopping power, and if you can get them into the right position and in a siege, if you can get them up, up onto the walls, raining down onto the enemy defensive positions, you are in a very good place indeed. So I think Barnak's army will maybe live and die, actually, by how well they use these crossbows here, because the rest of the Goblin line, even some of their better units, can be focused down and overwhelmed in a siege battle situation like this, and the main Goblin line is obviously a little bit thin on the ground when it comes to quality. Uh, we also have a catapult over here, which obviously on Minas Tirith, they're going to be using them to sort of peel away at the walls. Some heavy Goblin infantry, which in point nine six is relatively underwhelming. It's one of the few areas in which the Misty Mountains are maybe a little bit underwhelming at the moment. I feel as though they have some good tools elsewhere, but in point nine seven, I believe they're having a bit of a cost reduction, so they're a little bit more, a little bit more representative of what they actually offer. But I still feel as though they are a good, good enough melee target. I mean, you don't expect the heavy goblin infantry to do too much in the way of heavy lifting anyway. Uh, so yeah, they'll just be sitting in melee quite happily, dying for the cause, I'm sure. Another unit of heavy goblin spears there, and then we get back into the polearm retinue that the Misty Mountains have brought, and that's several units here of the Heavy Goblin Halberts, which, considering two of the defending armies in particular, which we'll get onto in a moment, the armor piercing on these guys is going to be very, very helpful. And obviously the phalanx as well is going to be useful just to try and keep the enemies at bay, because, you know, in terms of close quarters melee, the goblins don't have the biggest quality, but they will need to keep their formation, otherwise they too will end up getting slaughtered, and they need to be careful of ranged threats, of course, without a shield. Uh, Azog is once again going to be in his... The most common unit you see him in, really, in the Goblin King bodyguard, with their very darkened armour, with sort of the rusty red in there as well. Multiple HP, sword and board units, good enough for a bodyguard unit. Uh, they're not going to set the world on fire with what they can accomplish, uh, but it's a safe enough place to put your general. 
Um, you can't just send anything at them and expect them to come out victorious. The Goblin's King bodyguard can certainly hold their own in most situations, and they can also sort of make sure that the goblins around them stay in the fight for a little bit longer. Uh, it looks as though we have a unit, well, yeah, a unit of snow trolls, which the closest thing the Misty Mountains have to a sustained combat troll. Uh, they will last longer than the cave trolls in melee. Uh, they are very quick as well, although that's not going to be too much of a factor you would imagine here on Minas Tirith. Uh, but yeah, they're not quite as strong as stuff like the Trolls of the White Hand, Trolls of Angmar, or the Olag High. Uh, but the Misty Mountains, they, they will still do a good job for you. But the Misty Mountains do have the Cave Trolls, which overall, in terms of staying in sustained melee, uh, perhaps the weakest Trolls outside of the Drummers and the Artillery crew. However, they do have a very tightly knit formation, and as I've, sa as I've said many times before, fantastic line breakers. They will go through a line very, very quickly if it is not substantially reinforced. Uh, the problem is, is that when you do do this, you need to be quick to use the rest of your army to reinforce and go in through that gap as well. Otherwise, the cave trolls will end up dying and being surrounded and overwhelmed by the by all of the infantry that they've just crashed their way through. So, they do look easy enough to use, but you can get it horribly wrong. Meanwhile, the central most army over here, as we've seen before, is going to be 21. I'm just going to call him. I'm just going to call him 21 for the rest of the battle, or Harad. Because he is playing as Harad, and we have some Haradrim archers here, which naturally, as I've said before, in 0.96, very, very efficient to bring these low-cost archers. That will be changing somewhat in 0.97. Uh, some Southron archers back here, which honestly not as efficient as the Haradrim archers in front of them because of the way that the archers work in 0.96. Uh, but overall, more archers, going to put more ranged pressure on the enemy. The main body of the Haradrim army over here, you can see that, well, we're getting on seven in a minute, we have a few units of the Dismounted Serpent Guard, which overall... Um, probably the most solid unit in the Harad central roster outside of their really elite stuff. As far as the line infantry unit goes, they're pretty decent. Their armor values and their shield values are not particularly high, but they can dish out a fair amount of damage for the kind of unit that they are. You don't expect line infantry like this unless they're really expensive to do damage very quickly. Um, the Serpent Guard are probably very similar to the Uruk High infantry, both in terms of cost and effectiveness that you can look out for. Uh, but obviously Harad are most well known, I think, for their Trollmen units of all stripes, and the Trollmen of Harad definitely a very central part of that. They are essentially shock infantry in spite of the shields. They obviously have woeful armor values, as you can see from the like wooden slats that they're wearing. Uh, the shields, however, will protect them from arrows somewhat, as will, of course, the multiple HP, but the damage they do is the main attraction to bringing them. On the front, we have a unit that is capable of standing in a phalanx formation. We have the Muha Beast Tamers. Overall, obviously, the main risk to these guys as well is going to be arrow fire. Harad, in general, don't really focus around their armor values too highly. Uh, and in a siege situation like this, that could come back to bite them, particularly seeing as the factions on the defense all have very strong skirmish presences in different ways. So we'll see how the Muhad Beast Tamers get on, if they can get into position or not. Uh, we also have some Muhad Warriors, actually, which are the slightly cheaper option to the Dismounted Serpent Guard. A few more of them per unit, obviously much less in terms of armor value, not as good all around, but they are cheaper, offer a little bit more in terms of numbers, and obviously in a siege like this, when you're expecting to take a lot of casualties on the advance, that might be a wise choice. More Beast Tamers, more Beast Tamers. We also have the Champions of Nafra, obviously the, the bigger brother, essentially, to the Trollman of Harad. You can only have one, though, before the cost increases. Uh, like with most bodyguard units, you also need to support them sufficiently, otherwise they will be overwhelmed. But the Champions of Nafra, one of the scariest multiple HP shock troops in the game. And back here we have some Trollman of Harad, I believe. This is not the General, actually. Uh, we have the Black Serpent Bodyguard. So this cavalry... I'm actually a little bit confused as to why the Black Serpents have been brought, because they are Lance Cavalry units, and Minas Tirith is not really the sort of settlement where you can get in and around the enemy easily at all to try and hammer and anvil their defences, and even if they're being used as a sort of defensive measure, I feel as though the Camels probably would have been the best option for that, because they have an anti-cavalry bonus and their Jav Cav. The Black Serpents are swift, but again, maybe slightly newer players, but it will still be useful, considering that I do know the defenders do have some cavalry, uh, but the Black Serpents do need to be careful because that's a fairly large investment on something which may ultimately turn out to be relatively useless. Uh, but as we've seen, the Demons of the Desert, very, very effective in a siege situation. The other Trollmen units, so all of them are present on the battlefield today. Devastating range damage, obviously they're pretty damn good in melee as well. And in this situation, the scariest unit that Harad have to offer. We'll see if the Haradrim can take Minas Tirith if they bring the Demons of the Desert instead of the Mumakil this time. <laughs> then... The third army, we have Grim, who is not a new player actually. Um, so, some sort of some veterans on the field today, I suppose. Uh, he's playing as Umbar. Several units, of course, are savages with the armor upgrades. So, cheap and cheerful, 
shock infantry with the armor piercing. Naturally, again, their Achilles heel is going to be their really woeful armor values. They, when they upgrade the armor, it's at least not zero. Um, but even so, arrows are still going to be a bit of a problem. The AP will be useful, however. Going a little bit further back, Corsair Pikeman, once again, a unit very, very vulnerable to arrow fire, but also very, very cost effective if you can get their pikes down in melee. Cheap pikes are often very much like that, so we'll see if they can do that this time around. Uh, once again, we've got another unit of pretty expensive lancers, although the Numenorean lancers are not quite as expensive as the Black Serpents because they don't have the multiple HP, they're not a bodyguard unit per se. Still a rather puzzling decision though, considering you know they are Lance, Cavalry, and Minas Tirith is certainly not the easiest settlement, as I've said before, to get Cavalry sort of running around on the streets because it is relatively narrow, there's not a lot of space, and Cavalry can be a bit unruly in tight quarters like that, but we'll see if this Cavalry turns out to be worth it. Casimir's Legion, I've sung the praises of these guys quite enough at this point, I think. Fantastic line infantry, costly, uh, but in terms of quality, very, very good. You have to really go to the Elves or the Dwarves to find better line infantry for the same price. And even then, they often have a unit cap of two, whereas the Casimir's Legion go up to four of them. Very much a central pillar of Umbar. Abrazani Narduzagar as well, so this time a little bit less AP. They have the armor upgrade. Human Sword Master units, a little bit more skill based. Uh, could be useful against one of the defensive factions in particular. And then back here, a combination of the Narunaru Sentinels, one of the finest pikes in the game. And then Castamir is going to be standing with the Narunaru Royal Guard, which obviously Spear, Multiple HP Archer, Hybrids. Really good bodyguard, and in particular in .97, this kind of unit, like the Half Guard of Amon Sul from Cardolan, going to be a very safe place to put your general. Then moving over here, who has left his siege towers right at the back over there, we have Froggy, another player who we're obviously very well acquainted with. We can't actually see the vast bulk of his army. I would imagine that there's some Snaga knocking around. Uh, he has got some Witch Realm Hammer Guard, Witch Realm Black Guard, upgraded Guardians of Khan Doom. That Blackwatch Legion in here? Not that I can see. And then upgraded Witch Realm Pikeman as well, so obviously playing as Angmar. I would imagine that some of his units are hidden because obviously that's not an army which is full in terms of its uh, allowed unit size. There might be witches in here somewhere. Yes, I can see the witches. So we'll see if the witches can do some damage, obviously, in close quarters. Unlike the cavalry, the witches can be devastating. So, Minas Tirith. Uh, we've seen this before, and I feel as though they tend to work out relatively similar each time. Uh, you actually very rarely see the top of Minas Tirith used. And that is, be well, when you do see the top of Minas Tirith used, the battle is often decided well before then. The first layer is often what decides it, and how well the defenders set themselves out is going to be absolutely key here. I've seen on Minas Tirith quite a few times before the defenders fail to organise themselves in a sort of orderly fashion, and that costs them in the long run, because then they start to fall behind and there's very little that they can do to then stop the snowball effect of them losing. So, there are three defensive armies, one of which is Linden, played by Angel of Death, uh, one of which is Cardolan, played by Ding Da King, and the other one is Arthur Dane, who is played by... Venno 35. So, we've got some four Linden archers over here from Linden, just sort of covering this approach. Although it looks as though a little bit lighter on the defences this side, so I would imagine they're going to fall back relatively quickly, let the attackers have this portion of the city, and then try and hold on the choke points near the gate here. That is risky because it does offer the attackers uh, the ability to take these walls and start raining down their own skirmish fire onto them, uh, but we'll see. We'll see how well that works out for them. Some Arthurdane marksmen. Down here we can see some mercenary guildsmen from Cardlan. Obviously, Cardlan in general. I really like Cardlan. Um, I can see why people would find their lower morale slightly annoying and very off-putting. Uh, but in a siege situation, it will be much easier to keep their morale buffing units close by. And obviously, I believe they will be able to feel the effects of Linden's and Arthur Dane's morale buffing units as well. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, mercenary guildsmen over here as well. Then we start to get into the real meat and bones of this army. Some Dunedain rangers up on the wall over here. Rangers we've seen very recently how devastating they can be in a siege situation. Dunedain Peacekeepers, two units of them obviously very skillful. Uh, some Elven Cavalry, some Mithlond Lancers, which those Javelins could be very, very effective at dealing with stuff like the Black Serpent. So I would imagine there is going to be a little bit of a Cavalry phase as well as the Bombardment, but we'll see. But they are Lancers themselves, so actually the Black Serpents and the Numenorean Lancers, if they double-team them, the Linden Cavalry could be in a little bit of trouble. Obviously there's going to be Linden for Linden Pikes as well. Dunedain Peacekeepers, there's some civilians from Cardolan. Up on the walls we can see some more Arthurdain Marksmen. More Arthurdain marksmen as well as some Dunedain rangers, so Arthurdain's archers in full effect. Greenwatch garrison footmen, which again, very nice unit for Cardland, because again, cheap pikes, I'm a big fan of them, and in this sort of situation they could be absolutely key. We'll see how well they can do. 
mercenary warchiefs and more mercenary units a little bit sort of stronger in terms of their melee prowess than the mercenary guildsmen. Uh, and also, seeing as Cardlin tend to have lower morale overall, the lower morale of mercenaries actually doesn't really change how you play them all that much. Fornos Terrain Defenders, a bit of a rare unit to see in point nine six because the Dunedain Peacekeepers are just better in every way, but both of them have been brought this time, and Spears can also be used to help counteract mass pushes, which may, might be why they're here. Some Highland infantry back here as well, we've got some Four Linden Marines, obviously the Linden Javelins, Miniska Rithlin Spears, and over here we've got some more archers, Highland infantry actually up on the walls. Dismounted Knights of Anuminus, Tharbad Warhammer, so some really strong units back here. Miniska Rithlin Sharpshooters, Cardinal and Crossbows, there's also some units further up. You can see here some Fornos Terrain Defenders waiting further up the hill, and then at the top, looks like there are some units, in fact we've got a couple of units of Anuminus Gate Guards, interestingly enough. I would have suggested it would have been better off to just try and defend the lower part of the settlement with your lives, but I don't know. I mean, this is definitely a good team, I feel. It's like Linden, Arthurdain, and Cardlin have got the got some really nice skirmish synergy with one another. The archers of Arthurdain, the javelins of Linden, and the crossbows of Cardlin could work really well to devastate the attackers, but as always, I'm going to give the edge to the attackers purely because they have the numbers advantage, which always counts for quite a lot. And also, Min Minas Tirith is a faction which I've seen... A, a faction, a city, which I've seen poorly defended quite a few times at, to, at this point and one mistake can start a snowball effect where the attackers really start to take advantage of it. Also Grim and Froggy are good players and those witches could win the game by a single volley if they get into the right position. So I'd be interested to see what this cavalry does. If there is a lengthy bombardment phase because the Mythlon Lancers could also be used defensively although they're not. So we will at least see some cavalry action here but I will cut out the bombardment phase I think because if you just look at the length of this battle it is 74,000 frames long which I think in terms of frames, it's the longest battle I've shown, so I would imagine there is going to be distinct phases as the battle goes along. So as soon as this cavalry sort of outing from Linden has been expended, uh, I will then make a cut before the, uh, the attackers are ready to move in. Interestingly enough, it looks as though the Misty Mountains are actually going to the side a little bit rather than going directly for the city walls. Those Black Serpents are still just waiting. So here the Numenorean Lancers of Brim are going to move over to support Harad. Again, this really is... I'm not really sure that any side can strike a really decisive blow here. I mean, if the Mythlon Lancers die without doing anything, that's going to be a real shame for them. And they're also charging right into the gut of the Haraja Marchers, which you really don't want to do. Especially when you turn your back to them like this, because Linden's armor values are really woeful. And you can see that several of them already falling by the wayside. They do have a shield, so from the front that wouldn't have been as grisly. Uh, but baiting that cavalry out of the range of those Harad Archers might be the way to go. Try and use those javelins. Obviously, that is one of the weaknesses of Linden. They're really, really low armor values. Usually, they can compensate for that, and I do feel as though Linden are one of the easiest factions to play. But it is a clearly defined weakness. And there goes some uh, some javelins as well as some arrows from the walls. The Dunedain Rangers, actually. I would suggest that using the Dunedain Rangers at this stage is a little bit premature. You definitely want to save your Rangers. We've seen how thoroughly devastating they can be. I'd be surprised if there weren't Wardens of Elos Tyrion hiding around there somewhere as well. Obviously there's quite a cluster when it comes to the defenders. In fact, I think there's a whole section that I may have missed up along this road. Indeed there is, which is where I imagine yeah, Wardens of Elos Tyrion, a lot more elites from Cardlan as well. Cardlan's own Dunedain Rangers, for example. Here you can see the Mythlon Lancers moving forth. I would imagine that they're going to be waiting for Froggy's force, and there's, yes indeed, the Barrow Whites obviously are a unit that can hide, as well as the Snaga, so this is where the vast majority of Froggy's army reveals itself. And this is probably why there's going to be a relatively long wait before the settlement is actually assaulted, because the Barrow Whites are very slow, and Froggy is the army that's furthest away from an area of the city that he can actually attack. He's left his siege towers behind, though, so that tells me that he's going to be using the Umbar siege towers and allowing Umbar to go first, and then Froggy is going to try and be the powerhouse which drives his team to victory after that, which with the Barrow Whites in tow is absolutely understandable. Has Froggy actually got any ranged units except for the Witchers? I don't think he has, which makes them the ideal target for harassment from the Mithlon Lancers, to be honest with you. He could make their lives a real misery. Although it is worth saying that the Witchers obviously could destroy this cavalry unit in one or two volleys, but that would be a lot of ammunition for the Witchers that they have to expend on this cavalry when they would much rather expend it on a choke point fight in the interior of the city. It does look as though we are going to see the Mithlon Lancers. 
make some harassing motions. I believe the longest battle I've ever shown in Third Age overall was on Minas Tirith, and I believe it was just over two hours, which, if I have to show a lot of this phase because of the cavalry harassment, we could be cresting two hours once again. We shall see. Angel of Death, I'm not sure what he's doing. I mean, he, he doesn't have anything which can really oppose him here. I don't think there are any Snaga archers which revealed themselves, which... Yeah, that's all Barrow Whites and, and Stalkers, so he's got... Basically a wide open shot on Angmar, which he's choosing not to take, which I feel as though is a bit unfortunate. Umbar could very well have some hidden crossbow corsairs that we weren't able to see, so if he goes too close to them, they could uh, they could be in real trouble. He's also choosing instead to tangle with the Numenorean Lancers, which... In terms of pure melee, I don't know who I'd give the edge to here. The Numenorean Lancers, I think, are slightly more expensive, and their armour is pretty substantial, but Grim is choosing not to charge forward and try and engage them, electing instead to try and run. Several of his cavalrymen, however, are paying the price for lingering too close to the Elven Javelins. Obviously, the Javelins are a very central part of what Linden are all about. There are, of course, our Blackguards, which have revealed themselves, which is another powerhouse of a unit in terms of its close-range skirmish potential. Pretty decent in melee as well, if a little fragile. Here come the middle on Lancers. What are they going to target? They're going to go for the Witcher on Pikemen. Not a bad choice. At least they're not going for the Snaga, although I would certainly have suggested that trying to go after the Blackguard or even the Witchers if they were able would have certainly been a move. Don't know if it would have been worth going after the Barrow Whites. The armor-piercing damage is nice on the Javelins, but I don't believe uh, that they'd be able to kill them off quickly enough. Not with a single unit of cavalry anyway. The Barrow Whites obviously very, very resilient in point nine six. They will be made a little bit less so in point nine seven, but they will also gain some speed. Meanwhile, the Black Serpents not immediately folding under this Javelin Volley. Their multiple HP showing its benefits there, but they are starting to fall away now. The Black Serpents might be fast enough to actually catch the Mythlon Lancers. They are very, very quick, the Black Serpents. And they are going to be enough. And in melee, the Black Serpents should be sufficient to defeat the Mythlon Lancers, which is why Angel of Death is trying to force path them away. They're also winded at this point. Oof. That was a lethal volley we just saw there from the Corsair Blackguard. So, again... Not great map awareness there from the Linden Cavalry. Now they're going to get dumpstered. I'm not really sure that they've they've proven themselves to be all that worth it overall. Only 15 of them left. I mean, they have killed off a few of the enemy cavalry units, but the cavalry for the defenders is certainly not the threat here. I don't believe the Numenorean Lance or the Black Serpents will be all that useful in the interior of the settlement, especially not with all those pikes from all three defensive factions here, but yeah, that's going to be the end of the Linden Cavalry. They're going to break off all the way back to the town centre, but with only two of them, they'll probably get the perpetually routing bug. So that is the initial phases, definitely going in favour of the attackers more so there, because able to get a little bit of value off their cavalry, which I don't think they're going to be able to do as well when it gets into the interior of the settlement. Uh, and the defenders, the Mithlon Lancers, really not able to get as much value as they would have liked. Certainly not on the targets they would have liked either. So I think now might be the best time for a little cut, actually. Because I certainly don't believe that these Corsair Savages would be mad enough to try and mount the walls all by themselves. Because they're already taking arrow fire from the Fallen Marches and the Arrow Towers. And we saw that they can make a difference in the Siege of Dale, not so long ago. And obviously, at range, this is where the Corsair Savages are at their weakest. Uh, and they're going up against the Linden unit up on the walls, which is where their big clunky axes are not really going to help them out too much. They just sort of stood there. Is there any artillery over here on the Umbar Force? I'm not convinced yeah, there is. Interesting. That would mean that Misty is the only one who's brought artillery, which is interesting. Definitely going to make sort of opening up a whole bunch of holes in the wall a little bit more tricky, and that is often how the attackers are able to press home a bit of an advantage. I'm not sure that Froggy's army is going to be able to get into position in too much of an effective fashion here. Without any sort of artillery, he can't really press into this portion of the settlement, which is a shame, because Angmar would be able to clean up everything that's over here relatively easily, and then start putting pressure on the forces towards the air, although reinforcements are on the way. Mercenary Guildsmen, Harland and Infantry. So the defenders are going to defend this portion of the settlement, and I don't see why not, actually. With the lack... 
of sort of the ability to make holes in the wall, and also Froggy's complete reliance on the Umbar siege towers, of which only one is in position at the moment. Not a bad idea. Anyway, I think I will make a little cut here because it's quite obvious that the attackers are just sort of forming themselves up. When the first melee engagements start, I will rejoin the action. So interestingly, interestingly enough, the Mithlon Lancers actually did return from routing, and they're making life a little bit more awkward for these Haraja Marchers, which pushed forward without any sort of support. And you can see now, uh, because of the slight lag, I have actually turned down the particle effect, so that shouldn't be as bad in the future. Also, it does look as though the Misty Mountains are going to start trying to mount the walls, and they are also poking holes in the walls as well, but a unified assault is definitely what's needed here from the attackers. They do need to be careful as well. Obviously Grimm's, you know, his more elite forces are a little bit far away. If things start to go south, he's going to need to reinforce pretty quickly. Although perhaps he's banking on Froggy being able to do that for him with all of those Barrow Whites. Uh, Harad are also coming forward, although now the Ram of Umbar. I feel as though the, the sort of distribution of siege equipment here, both in terms of artillery, siege towers and rams, is a little bit strange from the attackers. Um, but ultimately it shouldn't make it shouldn't be too much of a problem for them. I mean, they are having to sort of linger in front of the Arrow Towers and the defensive arch is a little bit longer, uh, which is not great for them, obviously. Uh, but I do feel as though as well, I mean, these Dunedain Rangers are firing, but they're firing at Haradra Marchers, which is definitely not really a worthwhile use of their ammunition. I mean, Haradra Marchers are... They can do damage over a long period of time at range, but they are ultimately trash, which you, you don't really want to be going at. They're collateral at best. Rangers you really want to be saving for some of the more serious units, the likes of the Abrazani Narduzgar, the Barrow Whites especially. The Rangers would be excellent at dealing with them because they can deal damage to so many of the unit bombs so quickly. We shall see. It does look as though we're starting to get ready for a bit of, a, a bit of an engagement close to the gates on the walls. Uh, but the defenders are certainly ready for this, although I would suggest that these fallen into marines are not ideally placed. You don't want your javelins on the front line. There's also some civilians which are going to be sort of taking point. I wouldn't suggest the civilians are the best ones on the front line either. Civilians are really just chaff that you throw in the way to slow something down. There is a gap. Because uh, even Corsair Savages, you know, they may be AP focused, but they're obviously going to kill off civilians with their superior attack stats relatively simply. Dunodine Rangers, who have now pulled out their swords, they may have... Well, there is a... a large section of dead spears. Also, the ram is going to work on the front gate over here, although... Nothing of that good a quality over here. Haraj Marchers, Snaga Stalkers, Corsair Savages, nothing which the defenders will be too concerned about initially. If they can deal with them quickly and efficiently, they should be feeling relatively happy about this. The Heavy Goblin Spears, meanwhile, are not going to be advancing up the Siege Tower. Uh, the Heavy Goblin Infantry will fare even worse if they charge into the welcoming arms of the Arthurdane defenders, who actually are taking a bit of friendly fire. Again, this is not really a very efficient use of these Dunedain Rangers at all. Most of those arrows are hitting that siege tower. They're also, the, traje the trajectory is not right at all. You know, Rangers are like the golden goose of your army. You can't really afford to waste them like this, so it is a bit of a significant, a significant mistake here from the defenders, which I always get slightly worried about, because when defenders are outnumbered, mistakes like that can be amplified. Uh, fortunately for Arthurdain, however, Cardolan and Linden have brought their own rangers, so it's not as if they're the ones who are the only faction capable of dealing that damage today. Meanwhile, a scary looking phalanx here. Uh, nothing really that the Corsair Savages are going to be able to get their teeth into too easily. Dunedain Peacekeepers and Linden units, obviously not exactly the most heavily armoured units in the world. Meanwhile, uh, Corsair Savages, this is actually a fairly favourable engagement for them if they can actually get situated on the wall. Full Nostarain defenders do their damage relatively slowly, because uh, they are spears, obviously, basic spears with that spear malice, and also heavily armoured. So the axes should do a decent amount of damage. The problem is that they've stopped, and one by one, if they single file into the spears, they won't stand a chance. Over here, meanwhile, much better engagement for them. It says defeat seems certain. I imagine that's because of the arrow towers taking an effect. The civilians are not going to be too much of a problem for the Corsair Savages to actually deal with over the long haul, but they are going to get surrounded by a unit of mercenary guildsmen. Another siege tower, however, is on the way to maybe engage them. Uh, the, the shortcomings of the civilians will make itself apparent pretty quickly, actually. The Corsair Savages may not be very durable, but their damage is far in excess of what the civilians can hope to manage with their pitchforks. Our 
there's nothing too cunning about the way the attackers are going about this. This is, so far, a relatively straightforward siege. You can see here that the Four Nostarain defenders are actually doing relatively poorly against the Heavy Goblin Spears. They are much more resilient than the Heavy Goblin Spears to the Corsair Savages. Uh, and that means that more of them have been able to get onto the walls without dying. And now the AP is certainly going to help them. This is where those Dunedine Rangers now need to start firing directly into the Heavy Goblin Spears, because that will be worthwhile, because they're so densely packed that the Dunedine Rangers will rip through them. The Goblin Archers are in position, doing some damage to the Linden defences, and obviously, again, Linden's lack of armour. Bit of a problem here. The Heavy Goblin Halberdiers are coming forward, but they're immediately going to be met by a company of Harlinden infantry. And if need be, Ding the King has got some units of mercenary warchiefs that he can also commit. Uh, and in a very tightly packed, chaotic engagement like this, with their phalanx not really situated, the Heavy Goblin Halberds are going to really, really struggle against Harland infantry. It's a very poor engagement for them. Meanwhile, these Heavy Goblin Spears have actually managed to get situated up on the walls. However, they are facing a unit of dismounted Knights of Illuminance. Uh, and this is obviously a unit which is going to hold for a long, long time, even against an AP unit like this. And they are also going to get some reinforcements from some Merc War Chiefs. They're also receiving range support from, it looks like, some Minas Garethan Sharpshooters, so that's bolts as well. So yeah, the Misty Mountains are going to get absolutely stonewalled over here between the Cardlin Infantry, the Arthur Day Knights, and those crossbow bolts in particular are going to be very, very deadly. As the frame rate starts to uh, have a heart attack, because the Dunedain Rangers are shooting the right thing, doing a lot of damage to that densely packed cluster of goblin units. Now, the Misty Mountains have gone all in over here, but they are also pretty much the only faction responsible for this section of the uh, settlement. They're going to need some help from Harad, I think, to keep this attack going. One thing that I've always said in a siege is if you cannot keep the attack going, you risk sort of not really making any ground for all of the sacrifices you're making. There go the crossbows. Oof. Yeah, the frames are having a heart attack as we uh, have a look at those... Um, those units over there, not too eager to go through the gate yet, understandably so, they don't really have the manpower to make that worth it yet, certainly not the right units either. Meanwhile, these Corsair Savages just sort of hanging around, there's a bit of a gap open for them here if they decide to uh, go down there. Meanwhile, the two initial companies of Corsair Savages on this side, caught between several units of Merc Guildsmen, also the range support from the archers down in the streets. A key factor as this fight goes on, initially maybe a little bit wasteful with those ranger arrows, but now they have the opportunity to do serious damage to all of the attackers as they come forwards. Merc Guildsmen doing well enough against the Corsair Savages when they're outnumbered like this. However, a much more significant threat, I feel, are the Barrow Whites. The Barrow Whites are coming in, and the Merc Guildsmen are certainly not going to be able to do enough damage to them. The civilians, obviously, are in real trouble. They're already wavering. The Barrow Whites are a fear-causing unit. Civilians, naturally, not exactly the finest when it comes to their morale. Uh, the Barrow Whites is something which needs to be answered with significant strength. You either fall back from the Barrow Whites and regroup in a position where you can stand against them, or you need to commit more units forward in some capacity, whether that's ranged units or strong melee units, to stop them. Otherwise, they will grind you down. Very, very effective at what they do, the Barrow Whites. Uh, meanwhile, point blank shots from the Harajam Archers, although the shields of the Dunedain Peacekeepers will keep them relatively safe. I'm a little bit surprised the Dunedain Peacekeepers are not counter attacking, though. Just sort of lying down and taking it. The Dunedain Rangers are now idle. More ranged fire is coming in here now from the Four Linden Archers, but you can see here that the Goblins, Heavy Goblin Spears, and I believe there's Heavy Goblin Infantry in there as well, there is. So that's a lot of Goblins that's piled up that one siege tower, and a single unit of basic Arthur Dane Spears was not enough to stop that. So now, a bit of a conundrum on the defenders' hands. They need to commit either more units to the defensive positions on the walls, or they just fall back en masse. And based on the fact that the Dune Nine Peacekeepers are now counter-attacking outside the gate, that tells me uh, that they are willing to do what it takes to hold this lower layer of the settlement. Which, you, know, you can see obviously more reinforcements coming down, more crossbows, some more Cardland Spears. Meanwhile, down in the hole that the Misty Mountains opened up, the Snaga Skirmishers doing their best to throw their javelins into a good target. The Harland Infantry has taken damage, but so too have the Heavy Goblin Halberds, definitely ground up against one another. The ranged units, the catalyst for most of the damage here, I would hazard a guess. Meanwhile, yeah, you can see over here the crossbows in conjunction with the very, very strong dismounted Knights of Anuminus. Just the difference is night and day. You know, sufficient range support and a unit which is very much built for taking punishment. Over here and over there, single unit of Arthurdain spears, which only a few ranger volleys left in them 
ultimately the goblins were able to weather the storm. The rangers actually, who are out of ammunition, being committed to melee at this point, which... Maybe not the worst idea. The Dunedain Rangers, not exactly the most efficient target for the Heavy Goblin Spears to be going up against, and anything which engages them in melee while they're being shot in the back is going to help. These Goblins are not exactly the most disciplined, even if the Heavy Goblin Spears more so than the infantry. Meanwhile, what have we here? Yeah, those Dunedain Peacekeepers did fall back. You can see that there is a fairly decent cluster of units out there. Barrow Whites, Corsair Savages... That was a brutal volley there from the Corsair Blackguards. They're obviously a very strong javelin unit. They may not have the most ammunition, but they're also pretty damn effective in melee. Uh, and at this point, the defenders need to make some sort of choice here. I, I believe the play at this point is honestly to pull back and sort of try and defend this section of the city. More so than this one, because they're sort of running a little bit low on resources over here. And particularly with the Barrow Whites. The Barrow Whites are going to be a problem. Because they don't really have anything in sort of close walls. enough that is going to be able to contest them. Harland and infantry will be better than the Merc Guildsmen, but it's still not going to be enough to kill the Barrel Whites. There's another unit of Fawn Osterain defenders there sort of guarding this siege tower, but the defenders, they need to... They can't really afford to leave like individual units just sort of left abandoned, otherwise they're going to be in real trouble. They do, however, break this strong point of goblins up on this wall. That's a, a victory for them. There was a lot of goblins that had established themselves up on this wall, and now they're all broken caught between Merc Warchiefs and Dunedain Rangers. Although perhaps Merc Warchiefs already shaken. They need to get off this wall before half the unit is lost, because they can of course punch another hole in this wall. The announcer's not feeling too great about the defender's chances here. The Miniska Rithlin Spearmen now in position, holding the line where the Harland infantry were before. Indeed still are, albeit a very depleted version. And they're only having to deal with Goblin infantry, so you know, spears may not be the best at killing infantry, uh, but in this situation the infantry is of such poor quality that they'll be able to manage just fine, and the goblin infantry you'd imagine would break. All it'll take is really a single volley. The Snaga skirmishes are still there, the mercenary warchiefs do get down off the walls, which is good. Their melee prowess is not bad, not bad at all. Meanwhile, this heavy goblin infantry perpetually routing on the siege tower. There's that one which is just being shanked in the back by that four Linda marine. These dismounted knights of Anumanus not thinking of relocating anytime soon by the looks of things and now as we have a look over here at the main gate the assault has begun of course our black guards feeling as though they've softened up the defensive line enough uh, but four linden pikes and dunedain peacekeepers is a pretty solid phalanx to try and work your way through the barrel whites obviously are not going to take much damage too quickly against spears and pikes like this uh, also ding the king is going to commit a unit of somewhat depleted merc guildsmen to the front line to try and shore things up the issue however here is they may well be able to hold this area for quite some time, and indeed I think they will. Eventually the pressure will probably tell, but that's how it often goes in sieges. The problem is going to be, they have surrendered this area over here, which means Barrow Whites and all sorts of nasty stuff is going to be able to flank around and attack that gate position from, from the rear and from the side, which is going to be a real issue. Muhad Warriors now going up, Dismounted Serpent Garden, more Barrow Whites, there's a huge cluster there of Froggy's army, all of his elites. Uh, so I feel as though the attackers can afford to be fairly pleased with how things have gone thus far. They defused the Linden Cavalry with relatively minor losses. The Rangers were a little bit wasteful. They have taken losses, but that's to be expected as the attackers in this sort of situation, especially against factions that have got skirmish presences like the three that are arrayed against them. Meanwhile, the Dunedain Rangers at this point starting to look a little bit depleted. Another unit of Heavy Goblin Spears coming up, getting shot in the side once more. Again... Maybe not the most efficient use of Heavy Goblin Spears. I think a unit of Heavy Goblin Infantry would have done the job here. Much more disposable. Arrow bait. Cannon fodder. The Misty Mountains, I think, are the ones which have borne quite a lot of the brunt of the casualties so far. Because they've definitely attacked the area of the Sathmon, which was slightly stronger. And they've done it on their own. So I feel as though they've taken more losses than their peers elsewhere. Heavy Goblin Halberds now coming forward. The AP will be useful against the Minus Corinthian Spears, but they are also backed up by Linden units right behind them, four Linden Marines. Yeah, that siege tower is not looking like prime real estate right now with the Dismounted Knights of Anumna still parked there, obstinately. Keeping track of all these archers is somewhat tricky. Uh, however, the Arthur Dane Marksmen with the armor upgrades, their breastplates, not exactly the best angle of fire because they're having to go over this building here uh, but they are still making hits at least and doing a lot of damage to the Misty Mountains 
But again, I feel as though it's going to be the Cardlan Crossbows and the Linden Rangers at this point, which are going to be the, the ace in the hole for the defenders. When we get to the second layer, I think, is where the defenders are going to have to uh, make up some ground, because so far I feel as though things have gone slightly in favour of the attackers, which is never a good thing early on. And you can see the Corsair Savages and the Barrow Whites trying to make something happen. It says victory is a distinct possibility, and that is certainly down to the Barrow Whites with all of their HP. I feel as though a little bit more in terms of resources needs to be committed forward here, though. What have they got in the background over there? More Barrow Whites relocating elsewhere. I feel as though Harad need to commit forward some more of their units. They're a little bit too far back. Some Beast Tamers on the front line might be just what the Doctor ordered here, going pike to pike. It's obviously not something that Harad could do with Linden under normal circumstances, but just reinforcing those Barrow Whites and those Corsair Savages would definitely be very, very appreciated, I'm sure, as Froggy and Grim try to make something happen at the main gate. But over here is definitely where I feel as though the attack will have the most joy. Oftentimes, this is the area of the settlement in Minas Tirith, which is neglected a little bit in terms of defences, and it has proven to be so this time as well. Harad coming forward in a big way, on this wall at least, Haraj March is suiting into the back of the Harland infantry and a huge amount of dismounted Serpent Guard, Beast Tamers and Muhad Warriors are going to lay that Harland infantry low. So that's another Linden unit effectively diffused. More units getting up onto the wall. You can see that a sort of very makeshift defence is being prepared over here to try and give the gate some more time. But very depleted Merc Guildsmen and a unit of Harland infantry is not going to hold back a slew of Barrow Whites and a whole bunch of Harajim infantry for long. All of the rest of Grimm's army is now coming forward, so I think now the attackers smell the blood in the water and they are going to try and do damage. Indeed, you can see now a little bit more in terms of heavy-duty units being committed. The Snow Trolls, they're going to do a lot of damage to the basic Cardlan units. Merc Guildsmen and Minas Gerithan Spearmen just not equipped for dealing with Snow Trolls. Uh, and Merc Warchiefs piling in with some Arthday Marksmen that are out of ammunition is not exactly the best answer to this either. The Snow Trolls will do a lot of damage. They will go down quicker at least than Olak High. Uh, more range support is here. The Minus Garithan Sharpshooters also in close proximity. Their crossbows will do damage. They're having to arc their shots a little bit, but that is a nice block that they can shoot into at the very least. A lot of potential for kills there. Fall into archers. Meanwhile, there is the Misty Mountains artillery. Not a huge amount of kills there. It looks a lot scarier than it actually is in this situation. Um, but, still, we'll see if that unsettles the defenders at all. You can see over here that now the Misty Mountains have reclaimed this area over here. Out of ammunition, Goblin Archers reinforcing that position. There's a lot of fodder. The Dunedine Rangers are still on the walls, but against this level of Goblins, that's probably not going to go too well for them. Meanwhile, see now that some Corsair Pikemen have come forward, so Umbar instead are going to be the ones doing the reinforcing here. I think the time has come to fall back for the defenders. You know, they need to save what they can and start thinking about using the hills and the choke points of Minas Tirith to their advantage a little bit more. Because uh, the initial defences are starting to unravel. And they can't afford to fall too far behind. They definitely have the elites to pull it back later on. Uh, but if they fall too far behind, then they're in trouble. If it gets too choke pointy as well, Angmar have got a lot of nice tools that they can use. The Hammer Guard, the Black Guard, and the Witchers, three units which are very, very scary. And the Barrow Whites have definitely done their job here, having a bit of a street brawl as I'm stuck on one of the buildings. With the Harland Infantry, Harland Infantry under most situations are going to feel quite confident about their abilities in melee. Uh, but here, against the Barrow Whites, a little bit less so. The Elven skill will stand them in better stead than the Merc Guildsmen at the very least. But now Harad, victorious up on the walls. They're going to start pouring into the streets. They're going to be able to surround this position on the gates. That, however, is a shot coming from on high. Sharpshooters in position. You can see now that the Misty Mountains also starting to come down from the walls. The cave trolls. Uh, the snow trolls have sort of fizzled out a little bit, but they've already done some damage. The cave trolls are coming forward as well and supporting the heavy goblin spears. There's nothing but Arthur Day marksmen standing in their way, so... The cave trolls may not be the scariest trolls in melee, but they're definitely going to have no trouble here. Already shaken, yeah, this, this position at the gate is already lost. You can see Harad now rushing forward. The statue just in behind Gondor's gate is about to fall, and with it, the first layer should start to unravel as well. They may choose to hold the hill which leads up to the second layer over there, but I'm not convinced that's the right thing to do either. I think maybe they need to 
to start defending this choke point entrance to the second layer. Here's another opportunity actually for this cavalry to be useful. They can push their way through and then maybe try and charge down any stragglers, which is really going to be the only use for the Numenorean Lancers and the Black Serpents at this point, so obviously Grim, he knows what he's doing. Been playing the game for a while at this point, as well as Froggy, in good conjunction with one another. The Misty Mountains might start to run out of steam faster than their allies, but they've definitely done a job for their team here. The Barrow White's also coming forward, finding to support the Misty Mountains, take some of the edge off. Those are crossbow bolts, however. Here come the Numenorean Lancers, though. Uh, and again, this is a gift, really, for the attackers. The fact that they're going to be able to utilise Lance Cavalry in Minas Tirith, although the, the Sharpshooter stood up to that relatively well. They're a pretty tanky unit, and that wasn't the best charge of the Numenorean Lancers, so they should really take that as a warning sign now that they need to defend themselves. The cavalry is here, literally. Although this is a very interesting move from Grim. He charged headlong into a unit of Greenwatch Garrison footmen there, and the pikes are going to be able to... They're going to be able to do a lot of damage to the Numenorean Lancers. It wasn't as bad as it could have been, to be honest. If those pikes had been braced, that cavalry unit would have evaporated. Haraja March is here. You can see the Goblin King's bodyguard sweeping forward. A lot of these units routing. Still some hard infantry in the background over there, which could be a little bit annoying, but I think they'd probably be charged down anyway. At this point, this is the only defensive position that is of note. And even then, it's not really a position anymore. It's definitely a position that they have overrun at this point. The attackers, the Misty Mountains, working well with the Barrow Whites there. The numerous goblins and the strong Barrow Whites. The cave trolls also moving forward. So now, trying to retreat here. Obviously, breaking mercenaries. Very much a common sight. So yeah, this is going to be a retreat. Obviously, I, you know, this Greenwatch Garrison footman unit might be used to try and slow down the enemy. I, the Miniscar the Sharpshooters. I wouldn't use them as the rear guard, to be honest with you. You have other units which can be act as the pikes, whereas the sharpshooters with their maces, that AP damage in melee, even if they're out of ammunition, the AP in melee could be really useful, perhaps more useful than the pikes would ever be able to be. Uh, although, if the attackers don't support these cave trolls quickly, uh, the sharpshooters might be able to defuse a very potent tool in the attacker's arsenal, although reinforcements are quickly approaching. The Muhad Beast Tamer is going to be able to get those long, pointy sticks down in their phalanx, and at this point, Sharpshooters are going to try and get out of melee. They're going to take losses as they turn to retreat, however. Getting clubbed over the head by those literal tree trunks. Very much a fighting retreat so far. I'm glad to see that the Knights of Anuminus, at the very least, were able to get out of there. Uh, and one reason why I don't think this is the right area to defend at all is for the reason here. The Misty Mountain's doing exactly the right thing. Getting their crossbows up on the wall. I don't know if they have the best of shots, uh, but it is a shot at the very least, whereas if they retreat back behind the fortifications over here, they at least have some cover from the crossbow bolts, which giving the attackers Thank you very much, announcer. Giving the attackers cost-effective use of their crossbows is never something you want to do, because crossbows can be so devastating if you allow them to get consistently effective volleys off. Obviously, more awkward to use than archers is the trade-off there. Here we can see the attackers getting ready to mount an assault. They're just going to carry the momentum straight on. The Barrow Whites, the Witch Round Pikemen, and the Guardians of Khan Doom, all moving forward in support of the initial Haradrim units, which sort of trickled into the defensive line over here. So Angmar, very much the muscle here of all the three attackers. Harad, Umbar, and the Misty Mountains, a little bit more numerous, perhaps, with less quality throughout. Catapult getting his position. Again, the Catapult is another unit which could prove to be very, very useful. The crossbows, do they have a good angle? It looks as though they kind of do. They're shooting into the Miniscarith and Sharpshooters and the Hardened Guard, which honestly maybe not as bad for the defenders. If they were going into the defensive infantry, that would be much more of a problem because the pressure might prove to be too much. That's a move from Cardland. The Tharbad Warhammers are not something to be committed lightly, and their big AP damage will be very useful against all of the Angmar units in particular that are coming forward. The Guardians of Khandum and the Witch Round Pikemen will not enjoy being in melee with those Minas Garithan Sharpshooters and the Tharbad Warhammers together. And then obviously you have those Cardland Pikes in there as well, as well as I believe some Linden Forces are there. Yeah, some four Linden Pikes, so a lot of Pikes for the defences. means that Harad and Angmar are not going to be able to just slowly poke this defensive position to death. Meanwhile... 
This is when Minas Tirith starts to turn into a very long choke point fight, which based on the amount of frames that are left, perhaps should not be too surprising. But that is a lot of lot of attackers coming their way. The Harland and Guard can do some damage, but the crossbows here are certainly going to be a little bit more of a problem for the attackers, provided they get consistent volleys off. Uh, yeah, this is a force which is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Unless the attackers get some some ranged units into a good position. Now the witches are there. I don't know whether they have a shot. They might. Uh, but one volley from the witches could split this defensive position in half. Uh, Ding committing forward again. A, unit, a very depleted Merc Guildsman. But just to try and shore the line up with what he has. Just to make life a little bit more awkward. The crossbows I think at this point are trying to go for the infantry. Which is I think the right call. Uh, yeah, and the defensive skirmishes are going for the crossbows, which I, ne I never think this is a good idea, because crossbows, you need to kill off at least three quarters of the unit before it starts to become not very powerful. And these, these Minas Garithlin sharpshooters really, really need to be trying to help their infantry out here. They need to equalise those numbers somehow, and this is a good opportunity for them to do so. Because you can see here that the sheer weight of the attackers is slowly but surely forcing the defenders back on their heels a bit. More reinforcements are needed. The layers. Oof. I'm not a fan of layers, as you know. There's a time and a place for layers, and this is not it. This one unit of pikes, if they were back here, you know, that would be fine. Sort of setting up the next defense is okay, but making it so that the attackers just have to knock their way through one unit at a time, or at least a handful of units at a time, is something which the attackers are going to be very, very happy with all day long. Slowly but surely, you would certainly imagine the attackers will grow in confidence as the battle goes on. There is a hit from the Witchers, doing a decent amount of damage to the Sharpshooters. Now, the Sharpshooters are a unit which it makes a little bit more sense to go after because if they, when they do use up all their ammunition, they are actually a pretty effective infantry unit as well. Those maces, mace men. Uh, going after the Witchers, however, is definitely a good move. Probably will need to get his Witchers out of there. They obviously do have some HP, which means they're going to be able to survive a couple of volleys at least. So a bit of a warning sign from there to get out of range of the Cardinal and Crossbows. You can see here that some of the Barrow Whites have actually forced their way through the lines. And are now in melee with some of the Merc Guildsmen and Civilians that are trying to sort of plug that gap. Uh, naturally the Barrow Whites are not going to be too concerned about that. Meanwhile, Tharbad Warhammer's on the front line, but overwhelmed at this point the Cardinal and Shields start to move into position to try and back them up. Here come the attackers. Oh, and here we go. There's there's the, the Barrow Whites doing their thing. It's a very, very strange phenomenon, that. When you sort of try and push them as part of a mass push, they start to sort of dance all in and around the enemy, which can help, because obviously it can put them in and amongst the enemy formations, and it can obviously put them in behind the enemy formations in some cases here. But it can also work against them because it obviously means that individual unit models then find themselves utterly surrounded in a sea of units, which makes them much more susceptible, much easier to take care of them like that. Or at least it would be if the defenders were committing forward more units to reinforce this front line, which so far I don't think has been cost effective at all. A little bit disappointing if I'm honest. Well, these crossbows, I think, trying to get into a position which is easier to shoot from, but I think at this point the attackers have pushed them back to the to a point where it's not going to be as easy. The attacks obviously still have reinforcements which stretch all the way outside the walls. That umbar force there. Meanwhile, not even halfway through in terms of frames, I would... I'm almost imagining that the defenders are going to retreat all the way back up to the town centre, which would be interesting, and it would certainly account for some of these frames. Uh, we do have some more reinforcements. Again, I feel as though these mercenary guildsmen, if they were going to be committed, should have been committed earlier. At this point, I feel as though a lot of the damage that has been done could have been avoidable. Uh, and it is on the Cardinal player, unfortunately, more than anything, because he is the one which decided to commit to this defence, which, if his allies didn't want to do this, then he maybe should have liaised with them a little bit. But then again, I have also said in the past, that if you see your ally doing something, even if you don't necessarily like it, you have to play with that. Otherwise, you're just going to hurt the whole team overall in the long run. So I feel as though, especially Linden, considering they've got pikes which are just sort of stood here watching this massacre unfold, 
Uh, another unit of pikes could be very, very useful here. Linden pikes in particular with that Elven skill. They may not be sort of super strong pikes, but they're certainly stronger than anything Harad and Umbar have conjured in this match. And the Witch Round pikes are maybe a little bit stronger, but certainly less in number. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of men for the, the attackers to still work their way their way through, excuse me. This front line is probably going to take quite a while to wear down, if we're honest. He is almost a certainty. The Tharbad Warhammers are obviously a very strong unit. One of the strongest that Cardman can field. Uh, but, as with most bodyguard tier units, they are more limited in numbers. They need a little bit more support here. A lot of these units on the front line are also Umbar troops, Corsairs, and also those Muhards, which the AP damage is not going to be all that useful against. Of course, Starbad Warhammers will still cave in the skulls of Muhards and Corsairs relatively easily, but it's not as efficient as it would otherwise be. And now I think the attackers, you can see there, there's some Castamere's Legion. Playtime is over. The defenders have made the mistake of not reinforcing this line enough. And now the attackers are going to try and just smash this line to pieces, although it might take a little bit more. They have at least made some more yardage up on the defenders. You can see that the Barrow Whites have managed to sort of squeeze their way through the gaps. And at this point, this defence is a bust. It is, I think, going to come down to the potency of any rangers they have left in the backfield, I feel. So that's what it's... It says here that it's even... But the fact that the attackers are 2% ahead and we're not even sort of halfway through the manpower of both armies yet is a poor sign. Usually you expect the attackers to pull it back in the late game, uh, but we'll see. It's not a lost cause yet for the defenders. They haven't lost enough resources yet for me to sort of declare them dead and buried. Um, but from what you've seen so far, I would certainly expect the attackers to go on to win this. Casimir's Legion are now on the front line supporting the Barrow White, so those are those are big boy units at this point. Not the sort of thing which the mercenary guildsmen are going to be able to stand up to for too long. Especially not with a slew of Corsairs in behind, ready to reinforce with their pikes. Is that another unit? Of, no, it's just the same unit of Merc Guildsmen. Again, I don't really know what this unit of pikes is doing. If it doesn't intend to reinforce, it needs to retreat. I mean, there's a catapult there, which that linen catapult could be devastating in the extreme based on its position but the defenders will need to sort of defend this hill a little bit and they also need to sort of retreat a bit so that this catapult can start laying down its effectiveness again this is another unit of Merc Guildsman which didn't need to be committed and will ultimately be wasted which is a shame I mean every man counts when you're outnumbered as the defenders it is a slow but short grind and here we go finally a little bit of common sense prevailing the Merc Guildsmen are going to pull out uh, yeah, at this point in time, the Cardinal army definitely looking a little bit thin on the ground. Arthur Dane also taking some losses at the gates. Linden have taken some losses throughout. Uh, but Cardinal definitely the, the force at this point, which I, I would suggest have lost the most. Uh, and again, this is, this is something else which I'm not convinced of. The layers are real, and it's, you know, I don't like it. You know, these two units should be helping these two units in a big block. Two pikes melee infantry, spears, everything you would want, and then the catapult is there to deal those big game-winning hits. Uh, but as it stands, I, I feel as though the defenders need to get out of their own way a little bit here, because the, the disorganisation, I feel like, is starting to set in a little bit. They don't really know what they want to do to stop this slow but certain push of the attackers, and they need to make up their minds quickly, otherwise the battle will get away from them. Pikes are lowered, the Merc Guildsmen offering their support in melee to the Linden Pikes. Uh, but if the attackers just push forwards once again, I think maybe the catapult is the reason why they're probably not doing that. But it wouldn't take too much to get these two units in this gatehouse out of the way, I feel. Realm units still here. Still not even halfway through this battle yet, so it goes to show how elongated this skirmish 
skirmish this choke fight is going to be. Uh, but I would imagine at some point there's going to be some pretty significant blows dealt. The catapult is here. Nolder and blade masters are here as well, so it's not as if these units here that they've committed are lightweight. Nolder and guard are in close proximity. The fall into marine. So yeah, I, I feel as though this fight I think will be won or lost here in this choke point. And it will come down, I think, to how well the Linden player is able to use the resources he has. The catapult in particular is going to be the most important part of this defense. I'm not sure what he's trying to do here. Now they're starting to fire. The javelins are also in a very nice position, which is not easy to reach. So, let's see what the catapult is capable of. This is where the fight could start to turn back in favor of the defenders. The attackers, now that they're in here, in range of the catapult, they, start, they need to start pushing forward quickly to try and make it so that catapult cannot fire. Although, once again, the frustrations of using artillery in Medieval 2 becoming a little bit more apparent. As the catapult does its spinning dance, and the crew is dangerously close to the Castamere's Legion. Again, the defenders need to sort that shit out quickly, otherwise they're going to pay the price for it. Cardlan blocking the way with their lives at this point, which this time is understandable. That catapult needs to sort itself out now. Otherwise, it, it's game over. I, I would suggest. More Cardland forces coming forward with the Greenwatch Garrison footmen, so at this point, Cardland definitely throwing themselves on the pyre for their allies. They'll be very lucky if they see the end of this battle, I think, Ding's army. Catapult is pulling back a little bit. There's routing mercenary guildsmen. I would. Is it going to retreat all the way? That's really disappointing. No, this is where you want to be. And this is something else which is really disappoint. Oh no. Oh no. It's a disaster. It's an absolute unmitigated disaster. All of those javelins buried into the dirt. And this is why, you know, again, you need to shuffle your way forwards a little bit. Otherwise those javelins, real waste. Most of them going in there, only a few of them finding their target. And that's a real waste. That's a that that's devastating actually. The Rangers are in a decent position though. Ding the King. Trying his best to sort of make up for his his army not really putting up as good a showing as I'm sure he would have liked on the previous front line. This front line now. Comprised mainly of his troops with a few supporting Linden Pikes as well. The Dunedain Rangers are going to try and do their best to do as much damage as they possibly can. And again, the attackers are having to fight up a very steep hill, so even the very basic cardinal units will have a pretty significant bonus to their fighting prowess. Uh, but again, after a period of time has passed, you would still expect those forces to win. I would like to know what the Linden player's plan with this catapult is, because this, this is not the right place for it. It needs to be on this hill, shooting down into the units as they try and join the front line. Now the javelins are being used a little bit more effectively, but so much of the ammunition is already sticking out of the cobbles in the streets of Minas Tirith that uh, that's a real shame. Wasted ammunition to such a scale is, is always a shame to see, particularly when you're the defenders and you need to you need to do some substantial damage. You can see there though the blood spray coming off. Again, I'm not really sure what the Linden player is hoping to accomplish here with these javelins. Like, none of those are going to hit their mark, they're going to be buried into the gatehouse. And even if they did, launching them way up in the air is not really the uh, the answer to anything. High Elven Catapult is now coming back, which is good to see. In addition to that, the Noldor and Blade Masters are going to be coming to the front line, so that's a bit of a statement of intent. That the defenders intend to hold this choke point. I mean, they've they've wasted enough ammunition and manpower on it already, so they need to make it worth it in, in some capacity. The Rangers getting up on that hillside. The Catapult is in position. The Blade Masters are there. Or are they? Are they going to retreat? Looks like they're going to retreat. Again, the, the indecision is infuriating. <laughs> you need to make a stand as the defenders. and 99% of the time, whenever I've seen indecision like this, I would say, the defenders have gone on to lose. You, know, you, need, to, you need to make up your mind and, and sort of stick to it. A clear and defined battle plan is the way to go. And that's something which the attackers have had, to be fair. 
They've chosen their targets on the outer walls very well. They did pay the price in certain areas, but that's to be expected when you're on the attack in Minas Tirith. The defenders are going to have good sight lines to shoot you with. And ever since then, they've been going for the slow push approach, which so far has helped them. They've drawn out a bit of a lead. There's the catapult. A decent hit. They need to keep getting decent hits. Nice route there from the Muhad Beast Tamers as well. You know, the attackers have pulled a little bit further ahead from 2% to 3%. It was 4% just then. Here you can see some fire arrows coming into play. Again, another pretty decent hit. Primarily heavy goblin spears who are now shaken. Catapult can certainly start to turn this around. Artillery is an expensive thing to bring. For the attackers, it's very easy to justify bringing it because you can use it to peel away the walls like the Misty Mountains did and get a few hits, which are just a bonus. For the defenders, though, you need to get some serious kills to justify the 1,000 Florin price tag that they command. That was a nice hit, though. Right through the attackers. I mean, they can scarcely miss, which is why the, the catapult really should be here. You can see now that the attackers are trying to push through. But it's a lot of pikes they have to work their way through now. Arthur Dane also adding those dismounted Knights of Illuminus to the mix, which, again, going to be very difficult to fight their way through more Merc Guildsmen, so once again, Cardlin units with more men to the front line. Bisecting that unit of depleted Barrow Whites, but more kills nonetheless. Mm -hmm. We're near enough for the halfway point, at least a point where we can sort of take stock of things. Still 3% difference in favour of the attackers, which is not great. The choke points could help the defenders here, but again, the damage may already be done. Here come the witches. This this could be uh, another situation where the damage becomes a little bit too much to bear. Fire arrows from the Harajim, I think, trying to destroy those catapults. More units coming to the front line. Manitar, Robben, Guardians, Cardinal and Crossbows. Another power play, that. There's still units way outside the settlement from Grim that he can bring forward at any moment. The Umbar forces, I think, are going to be the final wave then. Angmar have taken a fair amount of damage. I mean, to be fair, it's not a huge amount that the attackers have left. Uh, but the fact that they've got the percentage advantage over the defenders at this point in the battle is concerning. Those rangers still have ammunition if they can get into a place where they can rip right along the attacking line. That's going to be good. The catapult has pulled back. Probably for the best, considering the close proximity at this point of the Witchers. After all, all it would take would be one volley from the Witchers. The catapult would be destroyed, and probably more as well, considering the close proximity of the infantry. It would have been too juicy a target for Froggy to pass up. His Witchers are in harm's way, though. If they've not, if, if they've gone unnoticed, then great. If they have been noticed by the Rangers, then this is... Yeah, and they have. They're starting to fall away. Where once there were 11, there are now only 9. The Witchers will be able to retreat, but so far the Witchers haven't been too... No, they haven't really decided the game as of yet. Froggy has had his nose bloodied a little bit whenever he's tried to deploy them, which that is to the defenders' credit. They have been aware of the Witchers, as you have to be. But this attack from the attacks is running out of steam. They need more men. Uh, you know, Umbar need to bring forward some of their men from outside the settlement at this point to get them closer to the action. They're too far away. There are obviously still reinforcements which are more readily available, Muhan Warriors and Witch Round Blackguard. Uh, but I still feel as though, you know, it, it doesn't really serve the team all that well to just have units just stood way far away from the battle. Much better to have them close to the action if they should be needed. And there are the fur capes of the upgraded Witch Realm units coming forward, the Witch Realm Pikemen getting in here. I'm not convinced that the Witch Realm Pikemen are the best units to be pushing with because they're going to take pretty substantial damage on the way forward and the only thing waiting for them on the other side is going to be Nolder and Blademasters and Dismounted Knights of Anuminus it looks like are going to come down from the hill and add their own strength to this front line this is what Minas Tirith has devolved into in the past a very very choke point heavy grind fest after the initial more open engagements on the on the outer wall Generally speaking, you can always tell what sort of Minas Tirith battle you're going to get. If it's decided in the lower part of the settlement, it's a shorter fight. If it's a very long fight, uh, you can bet that it's something 
along the lines of this. Still, you know, 4% the gap, so once again the attack is able to pull out a little bit more of an advantage. The catapult once again being very indecisive. I mean, at this point I feel as though the catapult is not going to be able to get into a good enough position to actually use itself. I'm actually surprised the cave trolls have not come forward sooner. Cave trolls would have been very, very handy to have a little bit earlier on in the fight. And once again, we see another wave of reinforcements come forward, which probably could have done with being here sooner. Cave trolls are sort of trying to wade their way through their own allies at this point. Again, just arrows, bolts, javelins, flying backwards and forwards, almost impossible to keep track of. The chaos of the battlefield. Uh, but the defenders have slowed down the attackers a lot. I mean, this is a choke point which the attackers are going to have to work for in order to get through. And while those Dunedain Rangers, 89 of them still remaining, they have a good shot at this point. Getting down there with the Tisa Muhad Warriors, very, very depleted, mind you. Those Goblin Archers in melee, of course, they're going to rout off. They're not very good in melee. That would be a bit of an understatement, in fact. The Cave Trolls, however, are not going to be used to push through the line. They're just going to be used as a cudgel try and beat these elves into submission uh, but that will cost them in the long run meanwhile ding the king once again every time his units break he commits them back into the fight as soon as they come back again just stalling this advance as best he can Aldrin Garda in position Menatar Romen guardians coming forward without the armor upgrade but the main attraction for these guys is going to be those bolts and that is a nice volley that those Dunedain rangers were able to get into this attacking position. The defenders have been a little bit wasteful with their skirmish presence so far, but this is the sort of thing which can change all that around. We've seen how potent the rangers can be, it's the perfect shot for them into good units as well. Witch Realm units, Witch Realm Pikemen, Barrow Whites, Guardians of Kandu are in there as well, I think. Or maybe not. Cave Trolls are in there. There's a few stragglers from the Corsairs as well, which as far as collateral goes, they certainly won't say no to. And if they want to get to the Dunedain Rangers, the attackers are going to have to go through a unit of dismounted Knights of Anumanas. Here comes some attacking artillery though, so now it looks as though we're going to start to see Harad pick up the slack a little bit. Froggy's army has taken a real beating, and I'm actually surprised they sent Froggy in first in this situation. All on his own anyway, because his army wasn't the biggest. I'm a little bit surprised that his Barrow Whites weren't more readily accompanied by stuff like the Muhad Warriors. They seem to only have a few Umbar units to support them. And they've been doing a lot of heavy lifting for quite a while at this point. Meanwhile, there are the Manatar Romen Guardians. Still not sure whether to commit themselves. I think they're going to let the Rangers do it. And if this position is still being held, they put the Manatar Romen Guardians up there. Another volley from the Rangers. Going to do significant damage. The Muhads in particular with their lower armour. Not going to enjoy that treatment at all. Just going to have a little look actually. To see where the defence is setting up. So as we go through the tunnel see that once again Linden layering a little bit too much for my liking. You can see actually here that there are more Cardinal units, Wardens of Tyr and Gorthard. Some Dunedain captains there as well, as well as the Half Guard of Amon Sul. So a fair amount that they had left actually. Arthurdain seem to be the ones to bear the brunt of things. The town centre is here, to be fair, so it's not the variant of Minas Tirith where the town centre is right at the top. Uh, which does of course mean that the defenders will need to sort of, you know, it, they will hold them here or they will lose. And I think to that end, the Menatar Roman Guardians are going to get into position right now and start to pour some crossbow bolts into this attacking position. Maybe a little bit lightly armoured these troops to make it fully worth it, but doing some damage at this point will be its own reward. Misty Mountain's catapult is down there, but it's not going to have the easiest time picking a shot out. It really needs to get up onto the flat terrain up here before it can start to consider doing that. Meanwhile. The Manatai Roman Guardians are here, trying to join the Dunedain Rangers in their quest to do as much damage as physically possible. A different sort of damage to the body piercing, of course. This is all about stopping power, armor piercing, a lot of base damage as well. And this really is going to be the end of this wave of attack. The Cardland Skirmishers in a brutally effective position. And unless the attackers come forward as one to just punch this defense out of the way quickly and surround these skirmishers, go too well for them. Uh, Guildsman routing off, that's a lot of damage being taken there. Muad Warriors, Southwon Archers, now we can see some heavy goblins coming forward, more heavy goblins, the Halberdiers pouring in, a lot of them at that. You can see Azog here, in his Goblin King bodyguard waiting. 
and the right opportunity to strike. You can see though that this front line is starting to look thin on the ground over here. That will be plugged, however, by some Harland and Guard, which will do the job for now. Rangers may be out of ammunition at this point, but they've certainly done a decent amount of damage. Now the Manitar, Rom, and Guardians will have to pick up the slack. Do as much damage as they are able to with their crossbows, and then of course, in melee, they become halberdiers, which will add another much needed anti armor component to the front line for when units like the Abrazani and Narduzagar come forward. Uh, but thus far, the Baron White's still standing, which, considering all the punishment they've taken, is to be commended, but they are ultimately going to find themselves. This is going to be a bridge too far for them. The dismounted Knights of Anubis are still fighting. They're winded, though. Shows how long they've been fighting. Elite units don't get tired easy. And forward come some more halberdiers. Wavering. Exhausted, shaken before they even get there. Not thinking... Not thinking too highly of their own chances here, which I can't say I blame them. Not so much in terms of the infantry fight here. Uh, but mainly because of the superior position of those Manitar Roman Guardians, which the attackers really have no answer to. This... Choke point in particular in Minas Tirith can be very, very brutal. Let's have a look at the percentage of kills now. Uh, and now it's come down to 1%, so those rangers did manage to close the gap a little bit, but maybe not as much as the defenders will have been hoping for, but of course they still have those wardens of Alos Tyrion, they still have the catapult, still have a lot of elite units left alive, which maybe will be able to do that for them. Have you got them halberdiers? Still shaken. And I would imagine that this is probably not going to go too well for them. Here we can see some Dunedain Rangers, ready, eager, and fresh. And some Dismounted Knights of Anunas, pulling back from the fight a little bit. They are winded at this point, but then they have been fighting since that engagement on the walls with the heavy goblins, which they so consummately won. Yeah, this, this is a wall at this point that the defenders have put up, so now the owner switches back to the attackers. Are they prepared to commit forward more serious troops? Because at this point they're feeding kills into the defenders. Basic units of heavy goblins and southern archers are going to achieve very little against this front line. The support of the Barrow Whites is now waning. So that all this is doing is allowing the defenders to get more and more kills. Manitai Roman Guardians are firing at something. And again, goblin archers are not the answer either. What do the attackers actually have left? they can call upon in terms of elites. Well, Abrazanim are coming forward now. Snaga, it looks like they still have some ammo. Angmar are not completely toothless there yet either. There's the Witches of Angmar. The Black Guard is still here, as well as the Hammer Guard, all of the scariest stuff. So yeah, Froggy is still very much in this with his best units. Grim is, of course, still in this as well. He has now moved all of his units to within the settlement, I think. Except for this one unit of Pikes, who quite enjoy being outside. Uh, but yeah, obviously still a very strong attacking force, but I think they need to commit forward a little bit more at this point. A little bit more. Because the defenders certainly are. Nolder and Blademasters coming to the aid of the dismounted Knights of Anuminas. Uh, and actually they're starting to turn back the tide here. The front line has gone backwards from an attacking point of view. They may very well need to rethink their strategy here. Come forward with something a little bit more heavy duty as the choke fight to continue. So yeah, this is obviously going to be a long one because I don't think there's going to be much in the way of cuts here from now until the end, considering the close proximity of the TC. I wonder where those Anuminas gate guards went. Because they were right up at the top, and that's going to be obviously fairly useless. They come back down. I can only imagine they did, because we didn't see them die off. Maybe they did, though. Maybe they did. Oh no, there they are. I don't know what they're doing all the way up there. If they lose the town centre, it's all over. But still a very healthy pike contingent left then. The, the Anuminus Gate Guards and the ones of Tyr Gorthad may not be the strongest pikes in the game, uh, but they're definitely, definitely top third. Here we can see here the Nolder and Blademaster is just scything through. The attack is here and the, the assault is breaking down and now it could cost them the Misty Mountains artillery piece. I doubt they're going to be able to get out of there. Although this is a risk, obviously, because the Nolder and Blademasters are here. They've, they've attacked forwards. 
and now they're going to be engaged by the Trollmen. This is still a battle I would give in favour of the Noldor and Blademasters, but reinforcements are readily available. Avrazani and Narduzgar adding their own might to this fight. I'm a poet and didn't know it. More forces coming down though, Harland and Guard, so perhaps risky from Linden, but this will potentially spur the attackers to try out a different tactic rather than just feeding kills into the defenders, and indeed it does look like that is what's going to be happening. More forces coming forwards. Mm -mm -mm. What have we here? The Abrazanium are on the front line now, alongside the Trollmen, but uh, the Noldor and Blademasters are one of the scariest units to fight in pure melee in the game. Definitely, definitely on the same tier as stuff like the Haven Guard and the Temple Executioners, to give you an idea of that. Arguably stronger than the both of them as well, because you know, they have the uh, the melee skill that you would associate with the Elves. Lower armor though, obviously. The announcer still doesn't make much of the defender's chances, although I would say that they have improved markedly to what it was when they were defending the area just through that archway there. It is now dead even as well, so the defenders have managed to pull it back. Still a pretty significant amount of time in this battle to go there. A little cut there because I feel as though I'm running out of things to sort of commentate on with regards to the the, the choke point fights. But this is a significant development. Now we have the wardens of Alostirian that have moved forward. We also have the Menatar Romen guardians. I think getting into position. There's still this one barrow right here, which is bravely facing off against the Menatar Romen guardians now. But he will certainly be poked to death. And this is good of the defenders. This is good map awareness. They're trying to move forward and take advantage of the, the ground they've essentially recaptured. Uh, and with the Menatar Rolmen Guardians and the Horns of Alos Tyrion, those are two units which are incredibly potent. Horns of Alos Tyrion have six damage as opposed to the Dunedain Rangers which only have five. So they will be able to do even more damage if they get into the correct position. Abrazanim are on the front line. Victory seems like a certainty though. So there is dangers associated for the defenders here. We can see that Harland and Guard are now moving forward, presumably out of ammunition, just to try and help shore up the line a little bit. Because yeah, Abrazani and Narduzgar over here are fighting off against primarily Minas Gerithin Spearmen, and you do need to support the Blade Masters, otherwise they will be overwhelmed by all of these elites. The Trollmen in particular. Very capable damage dealers indeed. Uh, so far, however, the defenders are being forced somewhat into trying to kill off these Southorn archers, although I would say the time for that has passed. There's only 14 of them. The amount of damage they're going to be able to do is small. Not a worthwhile target to go after at this point, especially now with another volley coming down on them. Now they need to hit the infantry. They need to go after the Trollmen. The Trollmen will be a very good target for the Rangers. Another somewhat concerning sight for the defenders as the Corsair Blackguards start to poke their nose around the corner. We saw how effective they could be earlier on when they decimated that Linden Cavalry and also did a number on the front line that was just in past Minas Tirith's front gate. There goes the Black Guards. I think they're going for the, the melee troops, which would probably be for the best, if that is indeed their intent. More grazing hit. Yeah, might, they might be going for the ones of Alos Tyrion, actually, and as a result, then they don't really have the best shot here, because they're just trying to sort of poke their heads around the corner so they don't get them taken off by rangers, but unfortunately for them they are in, in view of the rangers and are getting counter fire. And I would say the Corsair Blackguards are a little bit more worthwhile going after because they are more of a more of a threat in melee once they're out of ammunition and javelins in general are high damage. So you need to deal with them fairly quickly. This front line. Still holding firm though and this attack too is running out of steam so the attackers need to commit forward something a little bit more significant here. The Harlan Guard are, are retreating actually. The Nolder and Blade Masters need to be the ones to retreat next, I feel. They're a unit which you, if you can help it, you really need to get them out of there. Actually, the attackers have left now. Dismounted Serpent Guard's still here. Heavy Goblin Crossbows, which could still have ammo. Mm. 
and I'm not feeling as confident about the attacker's chances at this point. Manitar Ramen Guardian still up on the hill. This single choke point has taken up most of this battle thus far. There's a single Green Watch Garrison footman who's pointing his pike rather dangerously in the direction of his allies, pointing it the wrong way. Hearthguard of Amon Soul is another ranged unit that can be leveraged, not the highest damage and obviously not the biggest unit, so DPS not going to be huge. But still, that's more arrows that you can pour into the pour into the attackers. Still some Fornos Orion defenders. Meanwhile, as we go through the cliff, phasing through, here go the Nolder and Blademasters who are going really deep into the attacking army here, but they're going to pay for that ultimately. Corsair Black Guards and Serpent Guard, there's a lot of them there, and they're no pushovers. I think they're also taking point-blank fire from the admittedly very depleted Southern Archers at this point. Harlan and Guard are now going to try and go for that. Instead, the Nolder and Blademasters are going to sandwich Patrolmen and the Abrazani, which is going to bring about the end of at least this pocket of attacking resistance. Seems certain. That's an interesting, an interesting thing to say the least. Also, black guards are now getting into position. Ones of Elosteria in the back. Again, this could be an opportunity to deal a lot of damage to the Corsair black guards and the dismounted serpent guard. Here we go. Whoever gets the first volley here could decide a great deal. And I think, yeah, it's going to be the Rangers. And that is going to cause a bit of a retreat for the attackers. And I think this is going to lead to the attackers having to sort of reevaluate their uh, their attack here because they have been forced right back. So credit to the defenders, despite a few ropey decisions thus far. Well played to them. And this is going to cause a bit of a lull in proceedings, I think. So I am now free to actually make a little bit of a cut as the attackers sort of regroup and get ready to come again. Well, the bold moves from the defenders continue in earnest because they're continuing to push back against the attackers as they move forward. And I complained about the defenders' indecision, but it could be that the attackers' indecision could cost them here because... I feel as though they're reinforced. They are now coming forward in force now, which is obviously going to be a bit of a problem for the Nolder and Blademasters. But a lot of damage has been done to the attackers here. And at this point, the, the defenders are ahead, only by 2%. Um, and even so, in this sort of situation, I would still suggest that that might not be enough to see them over the line. But I do credit the defenders, certainly, for coming back into this game in a big way. Here come the attackers once again, though, with a pretty substantial push. Ones of Alos Tyrion are being engaged in melee. Again, dual wielders though, so certainly not to be taken lightly. I think this is going to be a bit of a general retreat, so yeah, maybe biting off a little bit more than they can chew. So, kicking the hornet's nest, and now the attackers are going to come forward. But once again, the top of the hill is going to be defended. The Anuminous Gate Guards have come forward. Pike unit not to be taken lightly. They will need support, however, but they will receive it. They've got some Arthurdain men at arms. Basic variant without the armor upgrade. The ones of Tyrion Gorthard. Noldering Guard still very much alive, but Catapult still very much a factor in the fight as well. A long and brutal battle in this one choke point. Once again, the Vaughns of Alos Tyrion going to be doing that body piercing damage as the Knights of Illuminus try to come to the aid of the Noldering Blade Masters. A very tightly clustered group of units here, which the Vaughns of Alos Tyrion can certainly take advantage of. But I think they're just going to retreat at this point, try and get into a position once again up on the hill with the Manitar Roman Guardians, where the Dunedain Rangers were before. Try and take advantage of the geography of Minas Tirith itself. So again, another minor cut just there, as the attackers now start to make the weapon. It's not a particularly well-constructed front line this either, because you can see the Witcher Arm Blackguard and the Witcher Arm Hammerguard of Froggy now moving forwards, attacking the side of this line. Serious units as well, the sort of things which are going to thoroughly, thoroughly outclass the Arthur Dane men at arms. They're going to need some more support. There are some dismounted Knights of Illuminus there. It does look as though the Wardens of Tyr and Gorthard are going to make their way forward. So that's more pikes. They're going to need huge support from the Hearthguard of Amon Sul and the Menatar Romen Guardians. 
Path Guard are not going to be able to do too much damage too quickly, but it will still be appreciated. It's going to be the Menatar Roman Guardians with those crossbow bolts, which are going to be the main thing. Those Wardens of Alos Tyrion, if they can get up there as well, the body piercing will be absolutely lethal. It's the sort of thing which could turn this fight in favour of the defenders, but they certainly need to hold this choke point. And it does look as though they are intent on doing that. The Wardens of Tyrion Gorthard are another very good pike unit, which can be used to shore this line up at least for some time. Here. here we can see some Manitar Rollmen Guardians still just raining death down upon this position. The lack of body piercing means they probably won't get as many kills as the Rangers, but if they go after the right targets, the Hammer Guard in particular can be a very, very nice choice. And there are the Wardens of Tim Gorthard not actually being committed just yet. I think they do need to be committed right now just to shore this line up just that little bit more. Here they go, it's almost like Ding the King heal. Heard me. Or Ding Dacking. There are the Half Guard. I mean, the Half Guard are another good unit to have in the back pocket into the late game because they might not be the best damage dealers in melee, but they're still multiple HP spears. So they will, at the very least, be able to assist in that. The damage that these ranged units are going to do, absolutely vital here. The defenders are not going to win this on manpower alone, they are going to need to win it through clever use of what resources they have left. And so far, so good. Despite a fairly rough start, we're into the final 20,000 frames, believe it or not. As we get in here, we can see that they have actually pulled out a lead. 2%. Or maintained a 2% lead, I should say, since the last time we checked, which is good. Uh, but I feel as though they could do with a little bit more. Now you can see that more serious units are being committed forward. Umbar committing forward their Naru Na'aru Sentinel. So this for the attackers could be the start of their, their main assault, really. Now is when they make it count. Of course, their Blackguard's still waiting in reserve. I would be interested to see where the Witchers are located. I don't want to miss any juicy Witcher action should it transpire. Those Blackguards are also loitering with intent. Ah, uh -huh, here we go. The witches are here, blending in nicely to this assault. So now I would... Were they up here? Oh yeah, here we go. Reinforcements from Arthur Day, sweeping in just like the Rohirrim. There's also another fresh unit of dismounted Knights of Manuminus up there, so... I don't know, that, you know, this could be... Could be the play. There's other Manuminus gate guards are there. Here come the Wardens of Alos Tyrion, shooting right along that formation, ripping into the Naru Na'aru Sentinels, which is obviously a very nice catch. The Naru Na'aru Sentinels, they may well, very well be a better pike unit individually than the Numina Skate Guards and the Wardens of Tyrion Gorthard, uh, but the issue is here the numbers and the range support. In fact, they're being backed up primarily by goblins. There are still those Witch Realm units in here, but they've taken a bit of a, a, bit of a bashing as well. Over half their units destroyed. And we've seen how powerful, particularly the Blackguard, can be in the past in a fight like this. The enemy general lies there goes dead. a general. That could fees up. I think that was probably Froggy. Both of his strong units were right in there. There's this. Of course, our Blackguards have managed to sort of shimmy their way through the line. Not many of them, though. And the ones of Alos Tyrion. Gonna pull out their swords here and just overwhelm the Corsair Black Guards. They're good in melee, but they're by no, me no means well beaters, and the ones of Alos Tyrion can certainly hold their own. Uh, here comes the cavalry, which this uh, not gonna go well. This is Pikes. They're gonna try and sort of sh sneak their way through this one choke point here, but they're gonna get caught on the Pikes, surely. And even if they don't, the Menatar Rollmen Guardians are right on station to make sure that anyone that does get through is introduced to the business end of the Halberd. Of course, our Blackguards did get through, though, at the very least. Here comes the Numenorean Lancers, although, yeah, they are taking... It, it's a nasty amount of attritional casualties they're taking, but, yeah, here the defenders are very much committed to holding this line by the looks of things. Noldering Guard, certainly one of the stronger units they have left and available to them. The Numenorean Lancers are here. At this point, the Hearthguard of Amon's Sul would probably actually be better off being committed to melee. Those spears could help make quick work of the already damaged Numenorean Lancers. They're already stretched as well. All over the damn place, so getting them under control for Grim is going to be a bit more of a problem now. 
as I back into a tree. Doggy is still somewhat alive as well with his army. Ooh, what have we got here? Snaga. There's still fighting going on down here, amazingly enough. I think. Nope, that's just the sound effect. So the rest of the Castamir's Legion unit is probably up here, so yeah, this is this is going to be the demise of this unit of Numenorean Lancers. They saw more use than I thought they were going to get in this battle, to be fair, but I'm still... I still find it questionable how two factions brought what is effectively a very similar unit. Harad dumped even more money into it when I feel as though they could have had something different. I can understand the logic of bringing Lance Cavalry in certain settlements, but Minas Tirith, it's, it's very narrow, very choke pointy, very, very difficult to use it like this. You can see that Muhad Beast Tamers have moved forward. Very much a pole arm to pole arm fight at this point. It's the Moldering Guard trying to help shore things up. Still a fairly long way to go in this fight. Ah, here we go. Witchers getting a nice shot there into the side of the Hearth Guard. Cutting that unit down to size, the Horns of Alos Tyrion are back. I mean, the Witchers have certainly announced their presence now, and they are all now being engaged in melee by the Noldoran Guard, and they will be overwhelmed and crushed by a unit of that quality. And the Dismounted Knights of Anubinus are also on the way down the hill as well. A fresh unit of them, which in the late game here could prove to be absolutely invaluable. Having said that, this defensive line is starting to look a little bit fragile. Manasar Rollman Guardians being committed to the front line to shore things up for now. Gonna need a little bit more, I think, though. Another unit of Numinous Gate Guards would certainly not hurt. Arthur Men at Arms are maybe a little bit basic, but at this point, every man will help. And these Corsair Black Guards. Back come the Rangers, and despite early troubles for the defenders, they could very well be turning this around. At this point, they have pulled out a 3% lead, so their lead is only growing. When they run out of ranged ammunition, I would curious to see whether that remains the case or not. The Rangers in particular are obviously going to be capable of dishing out much more damage than they have already. More units on the way, more beast tamers. The Castamere's Rangers are on the way, which I don't believe have used any ammunition yet, so if they get into a nice position, it's bad news bears for the defenders. There's still trollmen, there's still crossbows, I think there's still champions of Nafarat somewhere, and demons of the desert. So the attackers still have the tools. The defenders still have the positioning. It's Valos Tyrion, another volley. There are crossbow corsairs in there. And they don't really have much that can answer them at this point, because the defenders... Well, the Arthur Day Marksman would probably be a decent answer to them, actually. Their ammunition is probably a little bit less valuable. And crossbow corsairs are hideously weak to arrows, so they are certainly worth going after with your own archers, unlike some of the tankier crossbows, perhaps. And they're there for the taking, you can scarcely miss. Snaga Skirmish is moving forward alongside more Muhard and Beast Tamers. An older and guard, you can see that they're starting to wrap up the lines of the attackers somewhat here. I don't think Muhards and Snagas are what is called for here, that you need to send forward something a little bit, a little bit stronger. That's what Froggy did, leading from the front as well as the Umbar forces, but perhaps a little bit more is required. Again, crossbowmen. Some trollmen. Trollmen and the champions of Nafrat committed here could do some substantial damage. Here comes some fire ammunition. I'm trying to break the resolve of the attackers, which is, again, certainly not the worst idea. The morale is certainly going to be flagging in a situation such as this. Now that's a very risky move because you could bisect your own line doing that. I can see the appeal of trying to use your catapult, but if you go through your own men, then that could lose you the game at this point in time. Muhard's still on the way up. Crossbow's trying to get out of there, trying to get out of harm's way. The Castamere's Rangers, from down here, they can't have the best angle of fire. They will still do some damage, but the body piercing needs to go through the unit. As it stands, they're sort of hitting units individual models, which is obviously not not really what rangers do best. You can see the the slow speed of the arrows in general as well. Naruna Aru Royal Guard are on the front line, so that could be Castamir himself at risk. Although he may have already died. You can also see that Azog is on the front line as well. Can we see Castamir? 
he blends in a little bit more than the very white skinned Azor. I don't believe so. Maybe Froggy's general is still alive then. Who's Javelins? Interesting. That was probably the Umbar general. So Umbar and Angmar's general, I feel fairly confident that they are now dead. As Og is still on the front line there somewhere, but the Misty Mountains general could soon follow. This front line is still not really showing any signs of falling apart just yet. Nozer and Guard just absolutely wading through these units. There's nothing that can really stand against them. The Goblin King bodyguard already too depleted, as are the Sentinels. And they also don't have the best Ang on them. The Royal Guard, very similar situation. They need something else. They need another powerhouse unit up here. Again, Patrolmen, Champions of Nafrat, Demons of the Desert. It's on the Harad player now to step up. He keeps sending in these basic units, but they need something a little bit, a little bit stronger deal with these Noldering Guardsmen. It's about time to actually go up to times two speed to see how this choke point fight plays out. Mm -mm -mm. That frame rate. That catapult. They could get that catapult closer to be fair. Point blank shots have got a much lower chance of hitting your own men. At this point you may as well. Here comes another unit of Anuman Escape Guards by the looks of things just to really make sure that this front line is blanketed with good quality pikemen. Make it as difficult as possible and that could be a bit of a problem for trollmen as they come forward as well because the pikes could just keep them at arm's length and then whittle them down. Well, those wounds of Elos Tyrion. Looks like they're out of ammunition but they too can be committed to melee. There goes Azog. The pikes, the halberds, the knights all in formation. Looking glorious. Noldren Guard just continuing attack into the side here, now with the support of some Arthur Day men at arms, albeit very depleted units, but this could once again be the end of yet another assault that the attackers have made. Customers Rangers still there, I think I can hear, well the, the crossbows are in here somewhere. You can see here that the Noldering Guard, I think they're in danger of maybe overextending themselves a little bit, that's a lot of Muhard units which are coming forward for them now. More units coming forward, but again, it's south on archers. None of this is a particularly scary quality. Again, I can understand the precedent of wanting to make the final hammer blow with your elite units. But, in this situation, I think more quality is needed immediately. Hmm. Well... Here, javelins as well, so yeah, they're at the Snaga skirmishers trying their best, but not the easiest angle for them at all. Heavy Goblin crossbows don't have the easiest angle either. Noldring Guard have overextended themselves a little bit at this point, that's a bit of a shame. Again, Linden maybe getting a little bit overconfident. Should have stayed with the safety of the pike block that the defenders have formed. Those Arthur Day marksmen. Coming in from reserve, those Arthurdain units, which came down from the higher layer, could prove to be the difference in victory and defeat here. Still that high oven catapult. Still another unit of dismounted knights of Illuminas. Some Dunedain captains as well, with the armour upgrades. That's another important unit. Another unit of Noldoran Guard. Dunedain... No, they're not Dunedain Rangers. Those are four Nostra Rain defenders. Yeah, I'm not convinced, actually, that the defenders aren't going to win this, actually. I don't think the attackers have got what it takes anymore. To actually break this down. It's a really awkward position for the attackers to try and get through. They don't have any pushing units left. The cave trolls are gone. A lot of their manpower is gone. This could be the end. And it would be a very well fought victory from the defenders because it's not often that I'm able to criticise the defenders this much and they go on to win in a siege in which they are outnumbered. But it does go to show how defensible the deeper layers of Minas Tirith really are, I suppose, because this has been a really really potent killing field so far for the defenders. Once again we have more archers trying to go about their grisly work. Just a blanket. It's hard to see where the living units are and where the corpses begin. That's more routing. That's a huge route there from the Muhad warriors. I don't know what quite happened there. Big route. 
They should come back, to be fair, with, with 206 of them. Still troll man. Yeah, the, the, these Harad units need to uh, stop beating about the bush and get in there. Troll man, demons of the desert. It's possible that the champions of Nathrat have already entered melee and I just haven't spotted them. I haven't seen them. One player admits defeat. Surely that wasn't Harad. That would be devastating. No, it wasn't Harad. Then it was probably Froggy. He had most of his units right on the front line after all. Well, it could have been Umbar as well. Froggy and Grim. The two most recognisable names to me in this game anyway. The first two armies to fall. Taking the front foot, but ultimately not being able to seal the deal. So will their allies. Harad and a very, very depleted Misty Mountains force at this point. Until the next wave comes in. We are now within the final 10,000 frames, so let's have a look. And have a look at the spread and the defenders are pulling further and further ahead. This could be the defenders day in this marathon of a battle. Very depleted units of Knights Maneuvers coming forward, intercepting those crossbow Corsairs. And I, I feel as though the, the attackers have got too many skirmishers left. It seems like a weird problem to have, but at this point the attack, the defenders rather, can just counter-attack. The Demons of the Desert are here, which again, they're another skirmish unit, but... Oh, my bad. But again, you can see here, they're being committed to melee. They could fire point blank, and indeed they do, but... The majority of that was Arthur Day Men at Arms. And if the defenders are going to lose something at this point, they would definitely pick that to be the losses they take. As long as they don't lose that plate block, I think they're golden. Where are the champions of Nafarat? Surely they're somewhere around here. Get back to the action momentarily. That's not it. It's just a random triangle. Hashari Stalkers, are they firing just randomly? Ah, that's a real shame. Yeah, they're not going to get too much done like that. They're body piercing, and I know what they're trying to do. They're probably trying to shoot in here, get some body piercing done, but it's not going to work from way down there. The angle is very, very much against them. Arthur Dane's counterattack, the Demons of the Desert, sent fleeing, with their tails betwixt their legs. And there are the champions of Nafrat. They're in there with the troll man. This is it, the final throw of the dice for the attackers, and I don't think they're going to have enough, to be honest with you. I think the defenders still have more than enough resources to hold them at bay. It seems like we've been in this part of the battlefield forever. But there we go. Snaga leading the way. Uh, unfortunately for them, Snaga is not really what's required at this point. The attackers need a hero of some description, and I don't believe Snaga is going to be that. As the pike line still holds, the Manitar Roman Guardians returning to lend their support. Point blank volley there, though, from the Demons of the Desert. Again, if you're the defenders, you can never expect the attackers to just charge into your lines if they have a better option. Here comes the catapult. I don't agree with the announcer there at all. They're only 3% ahead, yes, but... The position they have is so dominant at this point. The catapult's also going to get into a nice position by the looks of things. As they come forward, the Arthur Day Marksman are in position, so are the Hearthguard of Amon Sul again. Not the highest damage, but at this point, just a bit of range support. Going to be very, very important. There's also those dismounted Knights of Anuminus and those Noldering Guards still left to be committed. It's a fairly, fairly beefy force, this, but this is it. I mean, if this fails... Then it's all over for the attackers, and the defenders have won a very, very hard-fought victory indeed. So we are going to get some more reinforcements. The Dunedain Captains, that's another unit that I forgot about. Cardinal going to be committing their Swordmaster unit. As the attackers try to force their way through with sheer strength. All of the Trollmen units fighting in unison. With the support of a few Castamere's Rangers, a few Snaga, a few Goblins here and there. That is Grizzly. Good hits. A little bit of friendly fire, but ultimately it's not going to matter. More routing. Those Arthur Day Marksmen, which I think are out of ammunition, are just going to be committed to the melee. Try and hold back that push. Yeah, 
that, that, that's going to be crippling, I think. I think that's going to be what ultimately decides this. Hashari Stalker's coming forward. Rangers, good skill. A 5% differential now as we enter the business end of the fight. This has been a long one. My throat is feeling very dry at this point. Yeah, I think it will. Four Nost Terrain Defenders coming forward. Half Guard of Amon Sul. Attackers finally able to push their way through the middle, but that's just going to be into the welcoming arms of more on-rushing un infantry. Bad times here for Harad. This half guard of Amon Sul with their very distinctive and large purple shields. Again, much like the Narin Aru Guard, they will be very, very useful. 10.97 I feel with the Buster Spears, a very safe place to put your general. They are now, but even more so in the next patch, the Four Master Ring Defenders coming in to plug that gap. As are the Noldering Guard. Now they're pulling back out. It's a very strange sort of in and out approach here. The Dunedine Captains are also coming back. Getting out of the way of the Catapult. bombarding this position and the attackers really didn't have much of a choice at this point. They had to come through here. Very difficult choke point to break down. There goes another general. Yeah, I mean, I can't help but feel as though they didn't have the pushing units to deal with this sort of situation. The cave trolls probably would have been their best bet that they were used earlier. Cave trolls were just used as a bludgeon on the front line and I don't feel as though that was... don't feel as though that was the right move. Have with you. South Ron Archers. That too is not going to be too effective at this point in the battle. Even the mighty troll men, demons of the desert, and champions of Naprat, who we've seen be so effective both recently and further in the past, not going to be enough this time to give the attackers a victory. And again, I think this long battle certainly makes up for the fact that I technically missed the day in the schedule. 74,000 frames in terms of frames is probably the longest battle I've done, although I'm not sure overall when everything gets rendered up and when I take into account the cuts whether or not this is going to be the longest battle I've posted, because I do believe the longest one was just over two hours, so I mean it's possible that this one is cresting the same sort of margin. That other, The other longest one was on Minas Tirith as well, I'm fairly sure. Again, it's that sort of map. Very choke pointy, very grindy, but it is iconic. The movie I feel as though would have been a little bit less climactic though had the Gondorian soldiers just plugged up a choke point, and that was it. Sauron just couldn't couldn't take Minas Tirith. Everyone had to all go home. That's why they brought the Olag High. The attackers did not learn the lessons of the movies, evidently. Not enough trolls. And not used in the right way anyway. The Misty Mountains are a little bit gung-ho with their trolls. But it's understandable. Can't expect perfection every time. Demons of the Desert are here. As are the Crossbow Corsairs, but yeah, this is this is pretty much the end at this point as they're gonna charge down the uh, down the road, so I think it's about time we went up to time six speed actually. To get this one over with, because this is going to be and just about, I think, within the 10% differential that usually signifies a close battle, but the fact that the defenders won is surprising, actually, considering I feel as though the initial engagements, the attackers had the better of them, they could have afforded to be very pleased with their efforts, and even the choke point just through that gate there was uh, not great for the defenders, I feel as though. But this one over here, the back and forth that took place, the defenders were able to leverage what, what range units they had left, the Rangers, the Cardolan, the Horns of Alos Tyrion, the Crossbows, the Hearthguard. It would have only been better actually if Arthur Dane had, uh, had saved their own Rangers from earlier, but even their Marksmen were useful. That's going to be just about that then. There's only one army left on the field, which I would assume is Harad. But yeah. Pushing forwards, the Dunedain Captains chasing down crossbow corsairs and actually yeah it's going to be this unit isn't it the black serpent bodyguards are the only ones left obviously not a great deal of utility to be had later on in the battle at least the, the Numenorean lancers tried to be useful even if it was a somewhat 
fruitless endeavour. But yeah, the Black Serpents here are going to be uh, put well and truly to the sword, or to the, to the halberd, I suppose. A very quickly executed frontal charge there. They're shaken, the rest of their force is gone. And there we go. That is going to be that. Well played to the defenders, considering the victory we have won here today. Considering I wasn't too complimentary of them early on, they did a fantastic job turning it around. Again, they, you could argue that they only needed to defend that one choke point, but they did that very, very well. Uh, Linden getting the most kills, not too surprising about that. Linden's units in general would be very effective here. Cardland doing well. Arthurdain getting noticeably less. I feel as though that's because they had a lot of their strength down here in the bottom layer, which is where the attackers did very well. Umbar and Misty Mountains doing well for themselves. Harad feels as though they needed to commit forwards a little bit more readily in the late game. That would have made a bit of a difference, I think, but even so, that still would have been a difficult choke point to get through. And so, a big thank you to Angel of Death for sending this one in, because uh, obviously this is from his perspective. Alduin Guard getting a lot of kills. Obviously, again, the Rangers, 802. Very high amount of kills on the Rangers. They were in a fantastic position. The Dunedine Rangers may have gotten a little bit more, actually, based on where they were shooting. Good, good kills for the archers all around. Noldor and Blademass is getting over 400 kills. You know, that counter-attack was effective, even if the Noldor and Blademasters were sacrificed for it. Good kills on the pikes all around. Over 200 kills on several units. That one unit fallen into pikes got zero. But other than that, terrific performances all around from the units that were engaged earlier. So yeah, big thank you to him. That was a marathon of a match. You know, my voice is on the verge of giving out, so this is the only one I'm going to be recording today for sure. Uh, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, this makes up for the, the one day's gap, I suppose. Obviously everyone likes a bit of, bit of Minas Tirith action. And I'm not sure what will be next. Again, like I said, I have been sent quite a lot of things by quite a lot of people. I'm trying to sort of go through them in such a way that fits together quite nicely. So I'm not doing something that's too similar, sort of one after the other. So we'll see what's next. I do have another siege, which is fairly lengthy in, from the RP between Cardolan and Rune. Uh, but again, I'll probably give it a couple of days before I do that, because obviously that's a siege rather like this one, which was relatively long by the looks of the frames. So we'll probably try and do one of the ones that I've got a mountain pass up next, because that's a different sort of, different kettle of fish, as it were. So yeah, hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you'll join me for whatever is next.